All right, good morning, uh, good afternoon, rather. Uh, as you well heard, today was the International Day of UN Peacekeepers. Earlier in the day, the Secretary General spoke at a wreath-laying ceremony honoring fallen peacekeepers. He said that our mission for peace will never succeed without courageous people willing to put their lives on the line and that we owe them an enormous debt. He added, peacekeepers continue to come under attack from armed groups, spoilers, and increasingly by terrorists. But the closure of operations in Côte d'Ivoire and Liberia over the coming months reminds us that the contributions, investments, and sacrifices of UN peacekeepers have contributed to the transformation of these countries from battlefields to peaceful states. He then conferred the Dag Hammarskjöld Medal in honor of those who lost their lives last year serving under the UN flag. He said US, UN peacekeeping is one of the intent, international community's most effective investments to support peace and security and prosperity and has a positive impact on the lives of millions of people around the world. There are risks when deploying peacekeepers to a crisis area, but he said inaction may carry even greater risks. The Secretary General added that peacekeeping is the most important element of UN branding and the most important aspect of the UN's image. And uh, you will see that late yesterday we issued a statement on the attack in Mali, which the Secretary General uh, condemned the attack on the uh, MINUSMA patrol that killed two Chadian peacekeepers. And also yesterday, uh, the Secretary General congratulated uh, the new Director General of uh, the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros, for his election as uh, the new head of WHO. His leadership of, who, of WHO will be crucial to ensuring a healthy lives and promoting well-being for all those, for all at all ages, he said in a tweet. And I have a statement on the departure of the Secretary General Special Advisor on Policy, Ms. Kyungwa Kang. The Secretary General thanks Ms. Kyungwa Kang for her many years of service to the United Nations system, where she is widely recognized for her advocacy of human rights, humanitarian principles, gender equality, and women's empowerment. Throughout her work for the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, and the Secretary General's transition team and then his executive office, Ms. Kang has earned a reputation as a person of principle and a voice for the voiceless. Ms. Kang has driven the development of the Secretary General's gender parity and prevention strategies with passion and expertise while acting as a role model and mentor to a new generation of women in the UN system. The Secretary General wishes Ms. Kang every success as she rises to meet new challenges in the service of her country. And tomorrow, the Secretary General will be heading out of New York for Italy uh, to attend the G7 meeting. On Saturday, he will participate in the outreach session of the summit, which is taking place in Taormina. The focus of the discussion will be innovation and sustainable development in Africa. And he will leave Taormina uh, Saturday afternoon. Uh, the head of uh, the peacekeeping mission in South Sudan, David Shear, briefed the Security Council this morning on the situation in the country. He said, as rains uh, have arrived in South Sudan, we are seeing a last push to position forces before roads become impassable. While rains may bring uh, respite to a larger scale military maneuvers, they also greatly complicated the UN's humanitarian response. He welcomed the announcement by President Kiir of a unilateral ceasefire and a pledge to review the cases of political prisoners. But he added, while the national dialogue launched on Monday, could bring a welcome focus to reconciliation. For it to be credible, it will need to be genuine participation of opposition constituencies. Mr. Shear also noted that a unified regional position on South Sudan remains critical, and he called on the Council to unite on a common strategy to advance the political process. Meanwhile, the head of the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Food Program yesterday visited Unity State in South Sudan and called on all parties to the conflict to cease violence and work together to ensure that food, water, and other life-saving support can reach people and end famine and severe hunger. More details online. The Secretary General Special Advisor on Cyprus, Espen Bert Aide, met today with the Greek Cypriot and the Turkish Cypriot leaders in Nicosia. He told reporters afterwards that both leaders seek to reconvene the Cyprus talks in Geneva, potentially in the near future, but he noted there are still outstanding issues. He said that shuttle diplomacy um, will continue to iron out those uh, issues. 
Uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Zaid Rad Al Hussein, uh, expressed serious concern today at the mass hunger strikes by Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prison as it enters its 38th day without a resolution. The health of hundreds of participating prisoners began to deteriorate significantly, he said. He added that he was especially alarmed by reports of punitive measures taken by the prison authorities against the hunger strikers, including restricted access to lawyers and the denial of family visits. The rights of detainees to access to a lawyer is a fundamental protection in international human rights law that should never be curtailed. More information in his statement online. And Jamie McGoldrick, the humanitarian coordinator for Yemen, said today that cholera is spreading at an unprecedented rate throughout Yemen. In the past three weeks, health authorities have reported over 35,500 suspected cases, a third of which are children, and 361 deaths in 19 of Yemen's 22 governorates. He called on member states to provide financial and political support to help avert an additional devastating blow to Yemen, where 17 million people are already food insecure, including 7 million people facing potential famine and 462,000 children in the grip of acute malnutrition. The speed at which cholera is spreading among the population exceeds the capacity of the health system to respond, given its weakened state after more than two years of conflict, import restrictions, and the lack of regular salary payments to health workers. Hundreds of thousands of people are at greater risks of dying as they face the triple threat of conflict, starvation, and cholera. Humanitarians are seeking over some $55 million to prevent and treat cholera at the national, governorate, and community level over the next six months. The UN and its partners thank the government of Norway for an additional contribution of $1.2 million uh, to this effort, on top of their pledge for the wider humanitarian response. And from Iraq, our humanitarian colleagues there tell us that a floating bridge has been in place in, uh, put in place by the Iraqi security forces north of Mosul's old city area, reconnecting the west and east Mosul after military operations had largely severed bridges in the city. In addition to its military use, the bridge will be used to facilitate transportation of displaced civilians. The number of civilians displaced is expected to surge once military operations begin in the densely populated old city, where some 200,000 people are reportedly still living under Daesh control. Protecting these civilians is a key concern for aid agencies. A large number of civilians continue to flee Mosul, where nearly 8,000 people recorded as newly displaced from western Mosul just yesterday. Iraqi authorities report 743,000 people have been displaced from Mosul since the start of the military operation in October of 2016. And humanitarian partners continue to provide assistance in this extremely fast-moving emergency. Since October, they've distributed food, water, and other items to 2.8 million people in the areas. And uh, UNICEF has issued a new report today saying that conflict is threatening the lives of more than 24 million children in Yemen, Syria, the Gaza Strip, Iraq, Libya, and Sudan. Uh, they say that children are having difficulties accessing, accessing essential health care, water and sanitation services, and nutritious food. More information online. And yesterday evening, the countries taking part in the ECOSOC Forum on Financing for Development Follow-Up agreed on a series of measures uh, to accelerate the implementation of the Addis Ababa Action Agenda uh, to finance and support the SDGs. New measures include stepping up efforts to invest in women and girls, supporting infrastructure to make cities more resilient, facilitating market access for least developed countries, and sharing experience on how to finance social protection systems, among others. These will help guide deliberations at this year's high-level political forum on sustainable development, which take place in July. And um, just uh, two more notes. Uh, to mark the holy month of Ramadan this year, Share the Meal, the official app of the World Food Program, is launching two simultaneous fundraising campaign, one to help uh, prevent families, uh, famine in Yemen and another to supporting Syrian refugees and children in uh, Syrian refugee children in Lebanese uh, and Lebanese children in Lebanon. With the app, users can share vital food and nutrition with hungry communities around the world simply by um, tapping on their smartphones and donating some money. And for the first time this year, Function gives users the power to choose where they send their donation. And lastly, I was asked uh, this morning uh, offline by a number of people on press reports that said that uh, 
a Unmogip uh, vehicle was targeted by Indian Army along the line of control near the Kanjar sector, and I can say to you that this, this afternoon in Bimber district in Pakistan-administered Kashmir, Unmogip military observers accompanied by Pakistani Army escorts heard gunshots in their vicinity. There is no evidence that the Unmogip military observers were targeted by the gunfire, and no UN military observer was injured. Halas. Masuji. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, as, as the last statement that you read out, it shows that the hostilities between India and Pakistan on the border and so continue to expand. And the Secretary General who has promised again, time and again, that he will look into this problem between India and Pakistan, particularly in reference to Kashmir, where many human rights, what you call, uh, violations are recorded. And when will the Secretary General get around to this particular question? I think, you know, as we've said to you, uh, we're obviously concerned at the, the situation in, in Kashmir, and it's, it's an issue that the Secretary General is following closely. Rosalind. I wanted to ask about the Trump administration's uh, budget proposal uh, for the UN and related agencies. Uh, general contributions would be cut by about $400 million for fiscal year 18. The uh, peacekeeping budget in particular would be cut by 90 percent. Uh, other international organizations and programs would get no funding from the United States. Granted, as Mr. Kari noted, that this is early days, that Congress has to negotiate the budget. What contingencies is the Secretariat making in case more of the money that the administration wants to cut is actually cut in the final budget? What is the message to UN staff and affiliates about the potential for a big loss of funding from the U.S.? I, I think we're... As Mr. Carr said, we're, we're obviously studying the budget, uh, going through some of the numbers. Uh, you know, I think from where, where we stand, I think looking at the budget as it's proposed uh, now would make it simply impossible for the UN to continue all of its essential work advancing peace, development, human rights, and humanitarian assistance around the world. Um, the budgetary process in the U.S. is, is what it is. Uh, it is going through a, a legis legislative process, so we will wait uh, to see what comes out of that legislative process. Um, I think it goes without saying, but it bears repeating that we're obviously extremely grateful uh, for the financial contributions that the United States has been making and is making to the United Nations over the years as its largest financial contributor. Um, you know, I don't want to get into contingency plans. Obviously, everybody's following uh, very closely. And I think the Secretary General has been, I mean, even before this budget came out, has been very vocal on, first of all, on the need to reform uh, and is engaged on, um, is committed and, uh, and will continue to work on reform, ensuring that the UN is fit for purpose, delivers what it's meant to deliver. Um, I mean, already, you know, I think since he's come into office, he has been very conscious of cost cutting, uh, asking people to limit travel, uh, asking Mr. Kari to do a review of how we use our air assets, which are a big, big part of, of the peacekeeping budget. Um, so we'll see what the situation uh, un unfolds. Uh, but we, we will need resources to deliver on our mandates. Yes, sir. Uh, Stefan Rohit, Bias, TV Asia. Uh, follow up to that. So in the meantime, are there any plans to ask all departments across the board in the United Nations to start conserving money for the future should something, should the U.S. The, the, uh, the, the Secretary budget. General has already asked uh, uh, all departments, and this has been for a few months now, um, to ensure see where, where, how they can spend the money more wisely. I mean, this is an effort we can always be making, uh, and it's an effort that he expects um, uh, staff to make. Matthew and then Benny. Sure. I have a budget question as well, but I wanted to ask you the question that, that I'd asked. Maybe mm -hmm. you could, you'll, you'll take a stab at it. If uh, a single country, France, has controlled peacekeeping more than 20 years in a row, five heads of department in a row, uh, I tried to ask Mr. Lacroix mm -hmm. what the benefit of it yeah. was. As you heard, I'm sure you heard. I didn't see if you were back there, but Mr. Kari seemed to say he's not, you know, he doesn't see him as French, which is fine. But I guess I wanted to know, you speak for the Secretary General. 
what was the process for selecting a new head of peacekeeping? And, and I'm sure there is a benefit of having France head it. What is that benefit, and does it outweigh the, the downside, which some people have articulated? Uh, Heads of departments, like any UN staff member, are here as international civil servants. Uh, they are here to serve the organization and not serve their own country. And that applies to, to everyone who serves, whether in a position of responsibility, of great responsibility, or of lesser responsibility. Uh, the process for appointing heads of departments uh, at the UN has been what it is for a long time. And the Secretary General has, I think, chosen the person he feels could best uh, provide the leadership for the Department of Peacekeeping Operation. Did he consider, I mean, I'm aware that it's happened, and it's happened five times in a row, but given that he's self-described as a reformer, when he came in, did he consider shaking things up, i.e. not leaving DPA with the U.S., Ocho with the I, UK. I think the, and the can you just refor no, the the refor the reform, reform, uh, no, I'm not going to confirm it because it's it's Shouldn't Secretary be? General's prerogative to appoint heads of departments as as he sees uh, fit. Some uh, some jobs are advertised, some other are not advertised. It's it's the prerogative of the office of the Secretary General. Um, so I, I don't know what else to. But shouldn't the process be? I guess my, if he's a reformer, shouldn't the, the process be? I think the, be I think you, the secretary general's results on reform uh, should be judged uh, at the end of his term, and I think we've already seen that he has he has changed things in how we operate. And on here. the budget, can I just add, just a, it's a factual well, question. He's listed today as at three o'clock presenting mm -hmm. his progr proposed program mm -hmm. budget for the biennium 2018-19 to ACABQ. One, is it open? Two, can we see the budget? And if Three, if not, why not? Uh, the process remains the same. This is a budget that has started, that was elaborated uh, before the secret this secretary general came uh, into office. As you know, in this, as you may not know, but it's it's kind of a long, uh, long process. This is the first step. It will go to the ACABQ, and then go to the fifth committee. Uh, the fifth committee del deliberations are often uh, open, uh, and then I think we'll get a clearer picture then. Benny. Yeah, following up on your discussion yesterday on uh, uh, rights, human rights for all sexual orientations, today the Supreme Court in Taipei became uh, the first in Asia to declare, to, to approve gay weddings, gay marriages. Does the Secretary General um, uh, commend the government of Taiwan for, uh, for being, becoming the first one to do so? I think the Secretary General believes that uh, everyone should enjoy the same rights in, in any country, uh, regardless of their sexual orientation. And following up on our uh, geography lessons yesterday, where is Taipei? What country? As you know, the United, the United Nations follows a one China policy. But we'll, we'll, I look forward to tomorrow's question on geography. Roslyn. Uh, the White House said that uh, at the end of uh, President Trump's meeting with Pope Francis that Mr. Trump announced $300 million to deal with famine in the countries which the Secretary General has highlighted in the past, Yemen, South mm -hmm. Sudan, Somalia, and northeastern Nigeria. Is that a direct pledge to the United Nations? Has the U.S. Communicated that I as haven't such. seen that, but I will obviously, if that is the case, that is uh, very welcome news. Uh, but I need to confirm it on our end. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have no, I have, I, I don't doubt the veracity of Al Jazeera's uh, facts. I just have to confirm it myself. That's the White House, okay, no, I, okay. Matthew, and, go ahead. Sure. I wanted to ask you today in, in Yaoundé, Cameroon, um, Amnesty International had scheduled a press conference about three teenager students mm -hmm. sentenced to 10-year prison sentences for joking uh, in text messages um, about Boko Haram. So I wanted to know, they, basically this was closed down, the press conference was disallowed, many human rights groups have said it's an outrage. And I noticed that yesterday evening, the Deputy Secretary General and the Chef de Cabinet were both at the National Day of Cameroon on <clears throat> 73rd Street in New York. So I wanted to know, what does the UN think of, of the, this country that just recently set, celebrated its national day with these two officials, shutting out Amnesty International, sentencing students to 10-year prison sentences? I, I look into the, the case. Do you ever look into the, the, the testing thing? I'd, I'd asked you about administering a test. Yes, I think uh, no from, we were given some guidance by, uh, by UNESCO, uh, and I will share that with you as soon as I find it. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Stephen. International Day of Peacekeepers is ahead of us, and 
I am from Bangladesh, as you know, and my country is the number one troop contributing country uh, for the peacekeeping. And their contribution and effort is reported by the world. Uh, they are doing very hard work. But within the country, Bangladesh, this law enforcement agency, <coughs> Bangladesh government, using to eliminate the political opponent. So how the Secretary General observing these issues in Bangladesh, though they are very much uh, active in around the globe and they are doing very good work, but within the country they are, government is using very wrongly. So what is the observation? Uh, I, will, I don't have anything for you on Bangladesh. Let me, let me check and get back to you. Thank you.